Welcome to this week's FSF and Tapestry podcast. This week we're joined once again by Dr Julian Grenier, Jill Jones and Wendy Radcliffe from Ofsted. And we ask our guests questions posed by reception teachers who are early adopters for the new EYFS and are struggling with perceived or real requirements for tracking children's progress. Okay, thank you very much for joining us again. This is part two of our discussions on the new EYFS and the new development matters. Um, this uh, session, we'd really like to focus on the reception year and in particular those early adopter schools. Um, and we've got some questions from our tapestry support group on, on Facebook, whose numbers have increased from 15,000 to 18,000 since we last spoke. So that's an obvious sign that people are really wanting to engage and discuss all things Development Matters and Ofsted and this, this very um, unique year ahead that we've got. So we've, we've got 10 questions to ask you. They're grouped again as they were before. And as I say, these are the ones that we weren't able to cover in our last meeting. Um, so we've kept them specifically for today. Jules, I'm gonna hand over to you for the first group. Thanks, Helen. So the first three questions are really around um, collecting evidence. Um, so I'm just gonna ask them one at a time already, and then you can answer them one at a time. So the first one is with the idea that workload is to be reduced through more teacher knowledge than spending time note-taking and recording, what evidence are we expected to provide to justify our decisions to SLT, trusts, LEAs and Ofsted? I think that's a really interesting question. And um, I think one from Ofsted's point of view, it very much goes to the one of the rationale and the case for change that we were looking at as we were developing the education inspection framework and that whole reduction in teacher workload and the fact that, you know, we don't require in terms of Ofsted for schools teachers to produce any assessment data for our benefit it's not something that we're asking for 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 inspection purposes absolutely and I, just to emphasize that point i think the uh, and i've seen a couple of these questions on twitter and i've i've said well you need to ask why your slt want that because our education um, inspection framework is predicated on knowing what it is you want to teach so your curriculum framework so defining what it is you want children to learn and how you teach it and then judging as a teacher whether or not your children have learnt what you you intended them to learn is the important thing so SLT need to be very well cited on what it is you're intending children to learn so your curriculum, I think they also need to be cited on whether or not they've learnt what that is. But that isn't the same as knowing whether or not you've got 50% uh, of your class at age um, 30 to 50 months uh, or 50% um, of your class at another um, age banded uh, phase. It's about defining the uh, the journey, the curriculum journey that they have to take. Yeah, I think, and I think that fits really well with the new approach in development matters. And I, I guess I would just unpick a few things in in the question. It is a really interesting question, like Wendy um, and Jill have intimated, and 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 it's common to see this online at the moment. So. The first question is around the term evidence. So first of all, there's that useful question that Jill and Wendy have just put back to us, which is what, what is this SLT requirement about? And uh, really trying to unpick that a bit. And maybe what it's sometimes telling us is that in primary schools, there's a real need for further professional development amongst the senior leadership team in what an effective early years curriculum and provision looks like. Because senior leaders really understandably feel hugely accountable for the children in reception like in any other year group. And they feel under an enormous pressure that those children should be getting a good start to their school and should be doing well. So I think we can all really sympathize with why senior leaders want to reassure themselves that the bigger question is what is the best way of assuring yourself 
that the quality of education and care in reception uh, is what you want it to be and, and also enabling the children to make progress. And I think that looking at a lot of evidence or data may superficially make you feel reassured, but it, it, it's in reality, it's a kind of fool's gold. It's, it's not the real thing. The real thing is getting into reception, seeing how well that curriculum is being uh, offered to the children, how well all the children are accessing it and seeing the progress that, that, that the children are making. So we have a kind of mindset shift that, that, that we need to do. I think the second thing I would say is that um, workload is clearly a really big issue. But when I talk to reception teachers, often the issue isn't the workload in itself. It's what they're spending a lot of their time doing. So a lot of reception teachers work and, and, and are prepared to work extremely hard for the children in their class. And, and that's why we, you know, we love reception teachers and early years educators, because you're so brilliantly committed to the children in your class. And it's, I'm not hearing from them that they wish that they had a lot less work to do. What I'm hearing from them is that they find it emotionally and psychically draining to spend so much of their time gathering evidence, analyzing evidence, turning that into numbers, putting that into spreadsheets, comparing that to a target they've been given, that, that this is killing the art of teaching in the early years. So I do think workload in itself is important and we've got to make sure teachers have got a work-life balance and that, that workload isn't excessive. But more than that, it's about what is it that teachers productively can use their time on in reception and early as educators and how can we remove other stuff from their workload that is unproductive because then people will get much more job satisfaction they'll feel that they're putting their efforts where they're going to make a difference for the children um, so that that's the second thing and the third thing i would say is that you know evidence in itself is a slightly worrying term because when you hear evidence, you're hearing, I don't trust you, and I've got to see something to prove it. And the school sector will work much better if there's more professional trust, in my opinion. Um, now that doesn't mean that um, accountability and our responsibility to parents for their children thriving in the early years is in any way diminished. But there has to be trust in the system for us all to, to, to work as well as we can. So I would take the emphasis off evidence and think more. What sort of information could I collect that is going to be really useful? So, and that is really a decision for individual schools and teachers and early as educators to take. I don't think anyone can give a blueprint that is going to be right for everywhere in the country. But what I would say has been our experience in this corner of Newham in East London is that something that is very valuable is uh, a shared bit of assessment information that really speaks to a parent about the progress their child is making. So maybe something that documents a child achieving something that was really significant for that child goes into the sort of language they use, the way they persevered and overcame difficulties in their learning the new skill they learned or the new idea they got to grips with. And um, these things really speak to parents. Um, they're also really useful to share with children because they help children become more aware of their own learning. And there's lots of promising evidence that that focus on metacognition really boosts children's early learning. So, so that's why we do spend time doing that, but we don't do it very often. Um, but when we do it, we try and do it as well as we can. Thank you. Interestingly, the next question actually uses that word evidence again, Julian. So um, let's, let's see where that takes us. So the question two is, does this evidence need to be available physically or can it be kept online? So, yeah, I mean, I would unpick that in the same way, which is, are we saying that we don't trust our reception teachers and early years educators unless we can see something physically or, or online? 
and I hope we're not saying that, and the EYFS stat framework for the early adopter schools and the handbook make it quite clear that there is no expectation of physical evidence mm. where, wherever that is stored. Yeah. So I think I'll just, just add a couple of thoughts to that. The first thing is that I do think that's a bit different depending on the experience of the reception teacher or early years educator. In other words, I think where teachers are new to the age range or, or, or new to teaching, um, you might as a head want to see a few more examples of what sort of learning they see as significant and how they're understanding and assessing it than you would with someone who's a very experienced reception practitioner. So, so there's going to have to be some sensible um, individual decisions made by leaders depending on, on the, team that, um, the, the team that they're with. And the second thing I would say is that over and above everything else, the most important use of assessment is when we notice something about a child's learning, either something they're doing really well or something that they're struggling with. And we give them the sort of feedback that helps them onto the next step in their learning. You didn't need to write anything down there. You didn't need any evidence. You needed to be good at giving children precise but also encouraging feedback. Um, and that is the power of assessment, um, is, is how we use it kind of minute by minute, I think, in the early years. And I, I, I think, you know, I, I suppose I'm, I'm worried by the, 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 the term evidence, that people feel that they have to show evidence um, because, you know, we're talking to early adopters in a, in a world where um, evidence isn't required in the way that it was previously because your um, early learning goal outcomes are no longer being moderated uh, by um, local authorities and there's no need to produce uh, evidence to show that children have progressed from one age band to another age band that that isn't the the aim of of um, the new early learning goals or the aim of uh, the new development matters the the development matters is there to help you structure a curriculum uh, for your children to to prog progress through and so knowing what it is that you want children to learn is is really important and i i um was looking earlier on today at some some uh, things on twitter actually where it was it was talking about um, a reception teacher talking about what their children couldn't do so um they'd the person had identified that the children had um, a deficit in their speech and language element of uh, the EYFS and was looking for activities to help them develop their speech and language. That is, you know, to, to the problem with that is, is twofold really. Once that one, that speech and language is an all encompassing uh, term that can describe a multitude of difficulties and strengths within it. So it's not actually sharp enough to say, well, children are struggling with their speech and language because you need to know what part of that they're struggling with. Is it all of it? Have they got any vocabulary? Have they got limited vocabulary? Can they name words but can't string sentences together? You know, there are all sorts of levels of difficulty within that global phrase. And what is important for, for teachers to do is to know which elements they need to help children um, make progress in. So their curriculum and what they teach has to enable them to do that. So Again, it's back to what Julian says, you know, you, you've got to trust your teachers. You've got to trust your teachers to know what development in child development in terms of speech and language is. So to go from baby babble through to being able to um, make words, to being able to string simple sentences together, to be able to speak in more complex sentences, a very, you know, uh, quick, and, quick and dirty run through um, child development in terms of developing speech. But, but a teacher needs to know those stages 
ages in far more detail than I've just explained in order to know how to help a child that's struggling with their speech to improve it. And then once they've identified what it is that a child can't do and what they need to know, then you design activities in order to support the child to do that. So starting from activities without actually identifying what it is you want children to learn is a sort of cart before the horse thing and then producing evidence against age bands is sort of pretty unrelated to that really but you know you can put children into age bands of course you can but in terms of knowing exactly what those children need to learn to develop um, is is far more um, nuanced than any age band is ever going to tell you. So it's it's the knowledge that sits underneath those that's important and then what you do. And if you're doing it, the evidence is in the child themselves. You know, the the, the um, you know, and if your SLT are there, you you need to talk to them about what you've done and what the pro the progress that a child has made because I'm sure any head would would love to see um, progress in action in that way it's not about collecting data thank you jill um the last question in this section is do you recommend regular observations of children for their learning journals or do you think we should do assessment weeks at the end of a half term where we do all of our, of our observations then okay so i'm going to again say that these are decisions that are much better taken at school level than someone trying to give a blueprint. What schools need to think about is, you know, what, what's the purpose of assessment? What's proportionate? And from those big principles, then they can decide their, their operational protocol. And I think the second thing I would say is that I don't think it's necessary to assess all children to the same degree and if we do that then we make a mistake at both ends of the spectrum so we use up far too much of our time on children who are doing perfectly well anyway and we don't give enough time to children who might be struggling and that's where Jill is absolutely right that you've got to have precision in your assessment so if you've got a child that's struggling with their communication you have to spend more time with them, more time listening and talking with them and doing things that will encourage their language and begin to put your finger on where their difficulties might lie um, so that you can make the sort of professional judgments that we're all used to making, which might be in the area of, do I think this child is just a bit inexperienced? They haven't had the level of playing and chatting that some of the other children have had and therefore with a little bit of time and help and attention, they're probably going to do fine. Does it look a bit more serious than that? And they are really quite a long way behind other children in reception, in which case you might think about an evidence-based intervention like a field early language intervention to help that child. Or are you concerned that they may actually have a speech and language difficulty which is going to need more expert help from speech and language therapy? And teachers and early years educators are making those sorts of decisions um, all of the time. And to inform that, you would go well beyond development matters and you might look at something like universally speaking, which is an in-depth um, assessment tool to use with children. But you're only doing that with a handful of children where you've got serious concerns. And what we know is that if you can identify and help those children really quickly, that's life-changing for them. Boosting their early communication will not only make their reception year much better, but it will improve their emotional well-being, it will improve their move into year one, it will have benefits all around. So that's the handful of children you will be spending a lot of time assessing. And then there'll be a lot of other children who, because you know that the daily diet, if you like, of your reception class is very nurturing to children's communication, and you're talking with them and you're listening to them, you know that they're doing okay and you don't need that level of assessment detail for all of them. Thank you. Um, as you very kindly did last time, you've answered two out of the three in the next, <laughs> in the next group. So I'm just gonna ask this one, I think, which is around 
um, uh, a reception teacher saying, I understand not using the development matters as a checklist. However, in the absence of checkpoints in the development matters for reception, can you suggest any other milestones that we might use to support showing that children are on track for the early learning goals at the end of the reception year? So we're having a lot of questions around reception teachers saying, how can I prove they're on track? What else can I use if I'm not allowed to use development matters as a tick list? Yeah, and again, I think that's such an excellent question. And so goes to the heart of a lot of the difficulties um, that we have in early years. And this is why I think we're all so grateful for the early adopter schools in being brave and trialing this new approach and giving us feedback and helping us to get it right for the rest of the sector. So I really relate to that question and I kind of feel where it comes from. But it's looking at everything completely in the wrong way, in my opinion. It's looking the wrong way around. It's based on the idea that the aim of reception is to achieve the early learning goals. And what we're signalling with the revision of development matters and the revised EUFS framework, um, and I'll let Ofsted, of course, kind of comment on this from an Ofsted point of view in terms of their signalling, is that what really matters to children, but especially to disadvantaged children, is that there is a rich and broad and balanced curriculum in their reception year um, that's well structured and well suited to the particular children that come into your class, where you've mapped out the sort of progression in the year you want to see, and that links extremely well with the school's big picture of curriculum from the early years all the way through to the end of year six. These, these are the really important things. So the assessment that we do is best therefore geared to the milestones within that curriculum map. That's what we should be looking at. Are all children accessing this curriculum and making progress? That's the big question. Um, and is their learning secure? The early learning goals are a useful and important metric at the end of the reception year, just to give a summary of how well children are doing, to touch base in a structured way with parents so that parents know that, to make sure that year one teachers can prepare and adapt the curriculum so it's suitable for all those children moving in to year one the following year. So the ELGs are important, but they aren't the rationale for the reception year. So I think what reception teachers and schools need to do is, first of all, think about their reception curriculum and think about what are the key milestones in that that we want to see children making progress in and how do we gear our assessment to those milestones in the curriculum? And how does that all work within our school's big picture of the curriculum? And wouldn't it be better that a child went into year one and maybe hadn't achieved the early learning goal in maths, but their learning in maths is secure and they've made good progress in their reception year that the year one teacher can build? Wouldn't that be much better than a child that, if you like, has been jumped through the hoop of the ELG in maths and then arrives in year one and their learning isn't secure and the year one teacher has in effect been given quite misleading assessment information. It doesn't help their planning or provision um, in, in the slightest. So that's why I would turn that question completely on its head. Yeah, it's exactly what you've said, Julian. I mean, I totally agree that, that the previous question and the one that you've just given is, is looking at it's looking in the old world. It's looking at what we have all been trained to do over a number of years in terms of tracking children against um, some, some metrics that have been designed. And, and what development matters is, is about is just um, the new development matters that, that you've worked on, Julian, is, is about uh, helping 
practitioners to structure a sort of framework o over what it is children um, are likely to, to need to learn at different stages in their lives. But the, the actual flesh on that bone is for individual schools to really think about the child's journey from reception onwards. Um, mm. And what you put into reception should support them in being able to access the curriculum later on. So you're absolutely right in terms of the maths early learning goal. The maths early learning goal is, is one element of maths that is being assessed to, to give a, a, a rough measure of where the children are. Um, and, you know, year one teachers would have to assess in a similar way, only there are no early learning goals. Year two teachers have a, a sort of assessment framework, but in year three, year four, year five, there are no assessment frameworks. So, so actually, the school's assessment uh, journey uh, linked to the curriculum that you are teaching children is, is really important in that space. So, and if children haven't got the prerequisites that you need for them to start on where you think they would be starting in reception, then you can't start in that place because the children haven't got what they need in order to start there. So if children don't understand simple mathematical concepts like bigger and smaller or more than and less than, then actually best will in the world or, or one is one and two is two and three is three. And, you know, however many different versions of three you've got, it's still three. If you've got three things, if children haven't got that, then they're not going to um, be able to, to, to move on because the maths curriculum is hierarchical in its nature in that you need to know some things and secure some things before you can secure the next. Other areas aren't quite like maths. So if we take knowledge and understanding about the world, then you don't have to learn about a sea before a river or um, a mountain before a hill or whatever. It, you know, it's very dependent your use of language and the children's knowledge will be um, probably very wide ranging. And so depending where your school is, you'll need to think really closely about what is within children's experience and they're likely to know and be able to to have words and, and bring meaning to those words and what it is that they won't know that you might need to teach them. So if you live in rural um I don't know, rural Suffolk, you might not have a concept of what a city is like. Whereas if you live in a city in Newham, you're not going to have a concept of what rural Suffolk is like. And so your curriculum will be very much based on where children are and what they know and how you introduce them to things that are beyond their experience, which you can then do through storytelling, through, through books, through TV, dare I say, um, you know, that all sorts of mechanisms to, to ensure that children learn more and become excited and interested in the world. You know, that's why we've got provocations and, and other uh, things like that in our, our early years curriculum. So saying should what we, should we do if they haven't reached an age band is, is the wrong way to look at it. Look at it. The, the way to look at it is what do you want your curriculum to to help children to learn it's a framework for what you want children to learn and once you start thinking in that way about what are, what's essential for the children that i'm teaching this year what do they need to know by the time they go up to year one then if you're thinking in that way then you'll be able to plan your activities and check against what children are learning and what they're not learning. And those that will be ready and achieve the early learning goals will, and those that won't, you'll know where they are anyway. And that's, that's what's important, I think. I think and I think um, that then is a nice link into that question about the different age bands um, and uh, using those to assess children is, is to say that the, re the reason for development matter, matters being there is really as a kind of background guidance for schools as they design their early years curriculum, their reception or their nursery and reception curriculum, depending on the school. So you've got development matters there, which is guidance 
for your curriculum planning. And it's there to um, also, I guess, make sure that what you're planning to do is broad enough and ambitious. But really, Development Matters is more like the floor than the ceiling. So we would expect schools to be far more ambitious than just what's set out in Development Matters. But it's there just, just to, to check what we're all individually doing as, as schools and as school leaders and as teachers. Um, it, it's there to help us. So I think if you think about that big picture of curriculum, and then if you think about individual children, you wouldn't really ask the question of, you know, is it all right to go back to the three and fours band when I've got a child in the reception year? Because that's putting a Microsoft Word table ahead of the realities of children and teaching. What you're going to do with your reception child is begin with the level of development that they're at, help them to access the curriculum that you've got on offer so that they make progress. So some children will need a lot more scaffolding and help than others. Um, and again, every teacher knows that. So it's not really about which age band, it's about is the curriculum you've got in your reception class suitable and inclusive and ambitious for every single child? And then do you have the right teaching and learning techniques, the right scaffolding, the right routines, the right deployment of staff? so that every child can access that curriculum and thrive. Now, we know that not every child is going to achieve to the same level in that curriculum during the reception year. But what matters is that they can all access it and they can all make progress from their starting points. Those are the big questions to ask ourselves. Thank you. I think we're, we're covering these questions really well. Thank you so much for that. I think we're going to come to the last one, which is a biggie. Um, I think you couldn't have been clearer around development matters um, not being used as a tick list. I think everyone has really got that message loud and clear, hopefully. I think reception teachers, um, as you mentioned earlier on, are, are trailblazers, if you like, for this year. They're really trying mm. to find different ways of working and doing a lot of the work for everyone else who will follow next September, hopefully. Um, but there's still that matter of, of them not having the, the backup, if you like, from their senior leadership teams. And here's the question I wanted to ask finally from one of our members. How can class teachers persuade their senior leadership teams that they do not need analysis data of children's progress? Some um, MATs and local authorities are also insisting upon it. What power or influence does one individual teacher have in a school? Yeah, so we know that part of the rocket fuel behind that are the myths around what Ofsted will be looking for when they inspect. So I think that might be a really good starting point is just to remind everyone, uh, as Wendy and Jill are constantly doing, of what, what the myths are here. And I think that's a good opportunity just to summarise um, so if at this point I just share my screen. So I just think one of the things that as, as Julian has just said that actually, you know, there's all those myths around and some of those myths around what Ofsted might want to see. And I think this is a good time to just kind of summarize and just take us back to what the education inspection framework, the school's inspection handbook includes. And so both Julianne and Jill have just spoken around the curriculum and thinking about what we want children to learn. So thinking about what it is that we want the children in our context to learn, know and develop and why. And thinking about that it's the curriculum that sets out that programme of education and it should be that structure for those aims um, that are going to be implemented, the knowledge and skills that we want children to learn. Um, and then that enables the evaluation of pupils' knowledge and skills against those expectations. And it's all very clearly set out in the education inspection handbook. So um, this, there is no driver from Ofsted here is a correct interpretation, I think, isn't it, Wendy? Mm, absolutely. And I think as well, the other, the other things here is, you know, is individual teachers can take you know, refer members of senior leadership teams to the um, inspection handbook. 
it very clearly says that Ofsted will not want um, schools to create unnecessary workload for teachers. Well, it's probably worth saying here, Wendy, that Ofsted has a list of things that they will not do. Absolutely. And one of the things they will not do is to look at internal assessment data. So Ofsted will never come into your school and say, I'd like to see the progress data for your reception children that are in, in school now. That's not what we are, are looking at. Mm. Um, what we will be asking schools to do is to dis describe their curriculum, to tell us about uh, how they're implementing their curriculum and that will differ from being in year six to being in reception and what the impact of that curriculum is and how they know and that's that's not about uh, providing inspectors with um, a sheet of progress data that shows that children have made six months progress but it is about saying well we have taught our children x y or z and as a result they know that and they can do this you know so it it's a very different conversation from um, Ofsted's perspective so i think um it, it's really good to have those kind of myths constantly challenged isn't it because they do have a long shelf life yeah. um out there and then i guess at the risk of repeating something I said earlier, I, I really sympathise with the pressure that senior leaders feel under, that they really want to make sure that all the children are doing well in reception. And that is often the internal driver, is that if you're a head teacher or an executive head teacher or a chair of governors or a, a mat board, how do you assure yourself that all the children are doing well in reception? So what we need to create is a culture where we know what um, a high quality curriculum looks like on paper and we know what high quality implementation looks like on the ground so that that's a big part of where the accountability lies is in educational expertise rather than a lot of data which may or may not be accurate um, and useful so um, a lot of this goes back to the fact that early years and professional development in the early years is not necessarily top of the list for every governing body or mat board or school leader or executive head teacher. So we've all got a job to do to say that it's important. It's a really important phase in the education system and we all need to dedicate enough time to professional learning and understanding of EYFS to feel confident as school leaders that we've got it right. Yeah. Not that we ever will get it right, but at least we're heading in the right direction and we're committed to improving things yeah. um, all of the time. So the answers lie in the more complicated realm of how do you plan things well as a school leader, and implement things well as a school leader and check that what you're implementing is going well. And yeah. that's really where the action needs to be. Yeah. And just to build on that, Julian, I think you've raised a really important point there because as a school leader um, and say it's a primary school, you would really be focused on what the children achieve throughout their time in primary school. And you would be thinking across hopefully all the areas of the curriculum, whether that be PE, art, DT, um, uh, personal, social, and emotional education, maths, English, etc. Uh, the whole curriculum. And what you have the advantage of doing, which which um, some in some earlier year settings that are independent of schools, you, you don't have the looking down, looking up opportunities. Um, and, and what you have as, as a primary head is the advantage of thinking, okay, so in geography, we want our children by the end of year six to, to know these things and to be familiar with maps, et cetera, et cetera. What do those children need to start off with in that geographical journey, which will 
is embedded in early years in terms of knowledge and understanding of the world. So you can do some really, you can have some really interesting conversations with your senior leadership team about the subjects and where they start and what it is you will be doing with your children in reception that will enable them to get off on the right footing for that subject later on. So it's not to say you're teaching the, the national curriculum down in reception, but you will be thinking about what children need to learn by the time they've left the school and how reception fits into that big picture. And you can do that across all your subjects and that really benefits children in terms of, you know, let's take art. What skills do they need to learn in reception? But, are going to help them uh, develop as they get older so you know for example when do you teach them to hold the scissors correctly I know Julian that you do that in your nursery school so any any um, children that go up from you have had that really good experience of being taught how to manipulate scissors and how to cut with them which which is a skill that they'll need for the rest of their lives. So if I can kind of just dovetail on that which is I think really helpful it's it, it's in curriculum terms, it's going back to Bruna's idea of the spiral curriculum, which is that everything can, can be taught well to children at any stage in their development if we think hard about the way we scaffold the children's learning. Um, so, so I think that's the first thing to say. And then the second thing to say is that, of course, it's much more disorderly in early years than it is in later years in school because yeah. in the later years in school children have got a much clearer idea of what it is to be a pupil what it is to do what the teacher wants or intends you to do in early years we walk this interesting tightrope <laughs> between what we want the children to learn but what they happen to be fascinated in at any particular moment and we can get that really wrong we've all done it that the children are fascinated in something and we've tried to take their attention away and, and, and focus them on something we want them to learn. And that's why Development Matters importantly says, you know, plans must be flexible. The focus in the early years is very much on children becoming increasingly powerful as learners, just as much as it's on what they're learning. So we have to make tricky professional decisions all of the time about how we balance that, that all well. So it's always likelier to look much messier in, in early years than, than, than anywhere else. And that's where, you know, exactly like Jill is saying, those valuable conversations within schools play that significant role where there's actually that, that real debate and discussion across the year groups of, so what, what, what does that look like in early years? What are the sort of things that um, children will be learning, the skills that they'll be refining and developing, but also the fact that there's a very important part of early years that is driven by children's own interests and preoccupations and fascinations. And the great skill of reception teachers is, is balancing those, those two sides. I think, you know, what, Julian's been saying what Wendy's said and what I've been saying is change the nature of the conversation with the senior leadership team because the senior leadership team will need to feel assured about what you're doing and the way that they will be assured is if you talk to them about what you're doing with the children so that the children learn what they need to learn um, and if if that that conversation has got to change from they've made X months progress to the actual things that you feel children are developing and learning. So that although it might appear random um, on the surface that as a teacher, you've got a clear knowledge in your head about what it is children need to have in their toolbox in preparation for for going up to the next stage um, because every year in a school has to do that thank you so much i think we've reached the end of our discussion today um, as i said you've been so clear um, for everyone around what development matters is and what it isn't and what ofsted are inspecting 
Um, it just needs this year to embed for people, as I've, as I've said many times before, for people to read it. I think, I think you mentioned the other day it takes 90 minutes to read from start to finish. Um, sit down with a cup of tea and a chocolate biscuit and read it over the next year and inwardly digest and, and plan. We've got plenty of time to plan for next September.